Welcome to the next Java user group talk, again in English, and again a good friend from Spain, as last week. Uh, today it's uh, Jonathan, and he's from Barcelona, and he will tell us a lot of about uh, Kubernetes operators, and of course this Java. But before we start the talk, let's first have some administrator, uh, administrative information. A very big thank you to our sponsors. Without our sponsors, of course, it would not be possible to do all these online talks with this nice big marker and uh, all the other stuff. So please visit the sponsor websites. And uh, well, you have already seen some people are writing messages in the chat. The chat is for you just right here. I can see you are from Wettingen, Lucerne, Radby, Fribourg, Hünberg. Just right there from where you are, it's very interesting. If you have a question for Jonathan, please uh, write the question in the Q&A section and uh, I will ask Jonathan all the questions there. Uh, we have a small delay in our uh, stream. It's about 10 to 15 seconds. This is to optimize the stream for your device, for the resolution and the bandwidth uh, of your device and internet connection. So if there is a small awkward silence sometimes when we are waiting for uh, questions, answers, etc., it's because of the small delay. After the talk, you will be automatically forwarded to our Java user group website where you can fill out a feedback form. Please do so. Feedback is always very important for us as a Java user group, for the speaker, for his talk, and you can give feedback on the speaker, on the topic, etc. It's uh, very important. And if you have uh, suggestions for new topics or new speakers, just write them in the comments. And uh, after you have sent the feedback form, you have the possibility to leave your email address. It's absolutely optional. And to all who have filled out the feedback for back form and left the email address, we will raffle an IntelliJ one year license. And uh, most of you know it already, we have a YouTube channel. And uh, in this YouTube channel, we try to publish all talks we uh, do online. So every talk is recorded. And if everything works and is fine, then we will publish it. And uh, if you subscribe to our channel and click on the small bell next to the uh, subscription button, you will get a notification when a new talk is available. So that's it so far. And now I'm very happy to welcome uh, Jonathan here to the Java user group. And uh, that's your part now. Thank you very much. I switch over to your screen. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to say good afternoon and it chose German. Sorry, I, I don't know if, uh, because I'm not very aware of the differences, the language differences in, in Switzerland. So uh, thank you for being here and good afternoon. Um, okay, so we are here to attend. This is not, this is not to talk about knowing what it is to do Kubernetes in operators, but what it is uh, my experience doing Kubernetes operators. So this is a very significant difference just because I'm always, I always prefer to show my experience that than um, trying to tell how you need to do things because I'm, I've, uh, I've read, I've tried, I've experienced and I assume that uh, everyone can experience different ways. So I will present what has been my experience doing a uh, Kubernetes operator for uh, an application that we already have in, uh, in Red Hat. So judge for yourself. The main motivation for this presentation is if you are aware of Kubernetes and operators, probably what you see is that most of them are done using Go SDK or Helm charts. Well, so I thought, why? So I'm a Java developer 
I need to do it in Java. I don't want, I don't like to change my language just because I need to do something that has been done in the past using those languages. So I experienced how it is to create a Kubernetes operator. I don't know if, you, if some of you know who is this, this mouse here, but it was very important in my childhood. Um, so it bring me memories. Okay, so this is the contents of the presentation. Basically, obviously I will introduce myself to give you context about what are going what you are going to see or watch. Then I will present which can be your expectancies with this presentation. So in order to have everything in mind uh, while you are attending. Then I think every technology adoption needs to answer a question. Because if you introduce a technology for the sake of being cool or being trendy, probably you will suffer in the future or probably you will be starting uh, new paths every now and then. So the main, the main question is, okay, what I'm trying to solve, which is my problem, and then I will find which technology can help me to solve that issue. My, the answer I found was operators. So I will show you what I will explain you basically what are Kubernetes operators? What can you uh, take as a benefit from creating them? And then, okay, which is the life cycle? So how to create an operator, how to test an operator and how to publish this operator. If you want to publish your app in a market as if it was an Android market, so the Play uh, market, Google Play, um, well, it's more or less the same. So you can publish your operator for others to consume it. And then, then which is the execution process once you have the operator installed and how you can create your applications? And in the end, I will, I will give you some, some references that can help you in order uh, if you want to create your operator or if you want to know more. Those references uh, help me a lot in my, in my trip. Also, I want, to, I want to, to tell you that in this presentation, I, in my presentations, I always put, let's say, uh, all these uh, anchors that can bring you to the to the past. In this case, it's um, domestic computers. So I would I would start with one with the computer that I started in this world when I was fourteen. Uh, so probably some of the of the computers that you will see here can also bring you. Okay, looks like the audio from Jonathan is away. Oops. Hmm. Jonathan, maybe you can hear me. Oh, you are coming back. Yes, I can. I can hear you. Yeah, you, you were away. You started the poll and after the poll you went away. We couldn't hear you. Uh, now, it, is it okay? So you can hear me yeah. and you can see my, my screen? Yeah, you have to share your screen again. Looks like your internet connection uh, 
had a small uh, delay or well, it, yeah. it's weird because I have fiber 600 yeah. megabit symmetric so it, it is weird that no. I'm Somehow not the, suffering the from broke you should see my screen now yes there it is who am I yeah is it is it fine okay yeah, it's fine. It's fine again. Okay, perfect. I will continue. Sorry for. No, for no this. problem. No problem. Um. Okay. Um. Well, I'm recently uh, being nominated as Java champion. Also, I'm co-leader at the Barcelona Java User Group, co-founder of the JVCN conference that uh, Marcus knows very well, and. Well, we host it in, in Barcelona every year and we were expecting to have it in 2020, the sixth edition, but let's see if we can make it in, in 2021. And I'm working as a software engineer at Red Hat in the application modernization and migration team. You can find my Twitter handle, my email, my blog post and my GitHub repository on the left, uh, yeah, don't be shy. If you have questions, if you need help, if you want to know more, just ping me. So uh, ping me in Twitter or send me an email or just check my, my blog. Uh, I'm preparing the article for this presentation, but you can find articles for uh, using test containers or for migrating Spring Boot to Quarkus or testing camel yeah you can you can find several uh, articles that probably you can benefit from them and in my github account you will find also the the repository for this for this um, operator so what can you expect of this presentation as i said in the beginning is my experience is an introductory introductory knowledge so um, it's not going super deep in the operators but it's not a magistral lecture that I'm, so I'm not going to teach you anything. I'm going to show you and then you will teach yourself. And hopefully this is not the way. So this is a way and there are others. I can simply put you here, the, my experience. Well, this is a very famous computer too. So what is the problem we, needed to solve in our application well it's a regular web application that uh, you can download it from from the red hat uh, website you can build it from github or you can also use the templates to deploy it on openshift a uh, kind of kubernetes so what we wanted is to make even easier for users to install the application. So putting the application in a market where the user can go and click button install, that's it. So point number one was covered by this easy to use market that it is operator hub. There are two different operator hubs. One is the one that you will find if you go to operatorhub.io and the other one is the embedded operator hub on OpenShift. It's a market, that's it. You search for something, you will find it, you will click install, that's it. Also, we wanted to have something that can automate some tasks. Now, when you deploy something in Kubernetes, well, it's, you need to, well, there are different yaml files or helm charts that you simply well you deploy then if something happens you need to be aware of it and then fix those issues okay so uh, now i want to have more uh, pods in that deployment okay so you go and you touch the deployment directly and this will modify that but if you want to uh, increase the number of pods, but also 
uh, register something in the database saying, okay, there's a new pod, or whenever there's a new pod, you want to send a message to a Kafka, uh, or, well, you name it, you can have several things. Well, at the moment, you need to scale up the, the deployment, and then you will have to send that message. But now the operator can wrap several tasks inside this logic. Also, there's another thing that happens. So it's, okay, pods fail, health checks fail, what happens? So if a pod fails, okay, um, Kubernetes has a, a, if you are using a replica set, it will try several times to restart the pod and after a certain period of time, it will stop. But what if you need to do more things when something fails? Okay, it is failing by why it is failing. Probably you need to configure something, you need to um, start another process that hasn't been started. Well, you can do several things when you have uh, complex chains of, uh, of flow that, well, now there, it needs to be a person that clicks on several steps and does several processes uh, when something happens. The operator can also automate those tasks. And in the end, there's another point that it is if I want to have more control about what happens with my application, let's say adding more metrics when a pod runs, a pod uh, stops, when the memory goes up, goes down, whatever, but not simply connecting the pod to a Grafana, let's say, or Prometheus or when I want to have more metrics, something that, that gathers metrics from different pods and aggregates them and sends them to anywhere. Well, that's also something that an operator can help us. In the end, the operator tries to replace part of a person on some of the things that can be automated. So that was what we wanted and operators were the answer. So we continue with what is an operator. Okay, so for the moment, we know it is something that lives in Kubernetes that manages or handles an application, a user application. Okay. In more specific details, an operator is basically a watcher. So we have for one side, we have these CRDs and CRs, CRD stands for custom resource definition. And this is like the definition of my application. Okay, my application has a name as, uh, I don't know, I want uh, the password for the database needs to be this one. Uh, the port for um, one of the pods is this one. Um, the size of the of the file system will be this one. So you are putting in that CRD uh, several elements that define your application from the outside. So you will put technical elements, I don't know, uh, how much memory, how much CPU, how many pods do we want, um, the size of the, of the, of the disk, uh, you name it. But it will also have like custom fields, password of the database, name of the database, um, 
running mode, if our application can run in different modes, mm, I don't know, different fields that can tweak the behavior of our application. That all, all those characteristics will be on this CRD. So we can create the CRD, I don't know, um, my video club. The definition will consist on, uh, okay, how many movies it can store, mm, categories of the movies that it stores, mm, running hours, Mm, I don't know, uh, popcorn, it sells popcorn, yes or no, mm, name of the video club in the outside, color of uh, the walls, you can define that. And then you can create, well, uh, I don't know, um, Barcelona video club, uh, Zurich video club, Paris video club. And each one will have different values for those definitions. So those are CRs. So we have here three and we have three. Uh, Zurich Video Club, Paris Video Club, Barcelona Video Club. So we can have this definition and then the user can create several instances of our application. Okay, when we have this definition, then what we have, this operator, what we'll do is, okay, so this CR says, well, several uh, values. So what I want to ensure is that what it is running is exactly what it is defined. Let's say, okay, in the Zurich uh, video club, well, walls are red. Uh, popcorn, yes, no. Uh, and 10,000 movies. Okay, so the operator will check the running application and will check those values to see if those values are what are defined. So is there any application running? No, okay, I will create one. If it's an application running, how many movies does it does it have? 800. Oh, I need to scale Here up. Here are some to, results from sorry. a search. <laughs> my, my, my cell phone <laughs> assistant. I don't know. Okay. Okay. So, uh, I was saying that the watcher, so the, the, the operator will check constantly the definition of your application with the real objects that you have installed in Kubernetes. If you need to have three replicas for one element, it will check that there are three replicas for that element. If there are four, it will kill one. If there are one, it will increase to three. And the same for all the objects. So the operator here is ensuring that the definition is what you have in the cluster. So the operator has a watcher that watches for changes on those CRs. So the first change will be a new application has been created. Then the operator will pass this event to a class controller and this controller will execute the different tasks that need to be done to fulfill this event. So if it was creation, we'll create several things. If uh, it has been a change, it will implement the changes. Well, I have summarized uh, very briefly what it is uh, an operator. In the end, this CRD is basically creating a new API in Kubernetes. So you can go to the Kubernetes API, 
do a call and get pods. And this pod is an endpoint in the API. But there are no video club endpoints in Kubernetes. But once we define this CRD, we will have this video club endpoint. And we can interrogate Kubernetes. OK, give me how many video clubs are running or are there in the cluster. And it will answer with those three applications, so those three instances that are running. So like a regular object as the rest of the objects of Kubernetes, pods, deployment, replica set, uh, you name it, all the objects. So let's see what it is to create this operator. The usual way is to use Helm, Ansible, or Go to create operators. These are like three phase, five phases of an operator, but this is not, this is something uh, not very, not rigid. It's, it's like a, a utility to see the maturity of, a, of an operator. So an operator can be only basic install. So you install the operator and it installs the application, your application, that's it. Second step is to do the upgrades. So let's imagine your application moves from version one to version two. Then the operator needs to do several tasks in order to, uh, well, upgrade this application. Probably it involves on stopping the deployments, the pods, uh, change the image and starting the pods again. But probably it, it, it can also involve um, executing some scripts into the database or writing some files to the file system. So this step two is the operator will handle the upgrade of the, of the application transparently for the user. In the phase three, well, you have the full life cycle for, for all the application, basically, uh, well, creating, stopping, starting, and upgrading, but also uh, the storage. So all the things that I have stored in the database, the operator should handle the backup whenever it upgrades something or whenever uh, there's a failure and it needs to, well, to, to do the backup. And then if something fails, it can also uh, do the recovery. Phase four, it has, well, lots of metrics and log processing and workload analysis. So it is constantly checking the different pods and elements of the application and gives information or simply executes some tasks depending on uh, how it is uh, working your application. And the last phase is uh, the autopilot. So it checks the cluster and it, it is um, smart enough to scale up your application, change the resources about memory or CPU. And yeah, it also checks if there are issues in the logs and it needs to do something. And well, it also has scheduling tanning. So uh, depending on the application, it makes sense to simply, well, every now and then to do some tasks that will, I don't know, clean up backups or whatever. So there are several steps of complexity and well, you need to do more things uh, the more mature the, the operator is. In our case, we have used Java with OpenJDK 11, basically because we are also using Quarkus to create an operator that it is running without 
a JVM. So we are producing the native image for the operator. So something that can run in your Linux server as if it was any other application without having to install anything. It will be faster and it will consume way less memory than a JVM application. We are also using Fabricate client in order for our operator Java classes to connect to the Kubernetes cluster. We are using JIP to produce the images from the Java code without even having to have Docker to create those containers. Tools that we use, well, basically is Podman as the one responsible for uh, managing those containers instead of Docker. Dive in or sometimes in order to see which are the layers and the files inside each, uh, each image. And kubectl or OC that are the command line tools in order to interact with the cluster. We are putting our images in quay.io, something similar as Docker Hub, but it doesn't have this limitation that recently Docker uh, implemented. And also for local testing, well, we use, depending on, on the case, Minikube or Kind. Both are um, Kubernetes clusters in local. Kind is using containers to spin up the cluster and Minikube is creating a virtual machine with everything inside. Okay, so next step is how to create an, an operator, which are the elements that are involved. So first is the Java application skeleton. We started from uh, code.quarkus.io and selecting the libraries for Kubernetes. Then we had our application. Second step is everything from the deployment perspective of the operator. When you want to deploy your application, your operator in a cluster, well, the operator is an application that needs to have credentials to interact with the cluster. For applications, we have service accounts that are like users. So we are going to have a service account we are going to have a role that will define which are the elements that this operator is going to touch or have access on the cluster. So I'm going to list, I'm going to create pods uh, for, uh, for this operator. Role is something that it is namespaced uh, scoped. So means that the operator can list, create, or watch elements in that namespace where the operator is living. There are other uh, roles, cluster role, that imply to have uh, cluster-wide access. But in order to avoid that the cluster admin uh, user denies the installation of, a, of an operator that goes beyond what they, they want to, we restricted our operator to have only namespace uh, permissions, let's say. So we will have a namespace to install our, our operator. We, are, we will have a CRD, this is the custom resource definition, and we are going to have the service account, the role, and the role binding. Binding. This role binding is simply a file that is connecting the role and the service account. After that, we are going to have in our Java classes, well, we need to have the client. So the let's say the general client for Kubernetes. 
we are going to have something typed that it is the CR client. So something that can connect to the cluster, but referring to the CRD that we have. So this is not, this is uh, a more, more um, defined or specific client. The Kubernetes client is the general. And then we have something that instead of starting converting things, we simply have this CR client that it is a Kubernetes client for this CRD that lives in that namespace with that version. And then, well, it is faster to, to use. And then we are going to have also the object namespace to refer to the namespace where the uh, operator is living. Also, what we have is watchers. So, okay, we have everything here, but now the operator needs to watch, to start listening, which are the events that are happening for those CRs. So once the operator receives an event, let's say creation, update oh it checks the real cluster and say okay these are the differences between what i have and what i have set to have and then the operator will do its magic after that also we had watchers on the deployments so when you deploy uh, your application well you have an object, a Kubernetes object, that is deployment, where you define which is the uh, container image, the number of replicas that you want, and several uh, descriptions. And then Kubernetes will use this to create a replica set that it will, it will take care of scaling up or down the number of pods, for instance. So. What I want is to know all the deployments that my, my operator has created. I want to listen to them in order to know when they are ready. Because if I de create three deployments, and obviously it's not uh, instantly that they will be ready. So they start doing and starting its services and once the pod is said, okay, I'm ready. Those deployments are constantly updating their status element. So what I want to know is when I receive a deployment that is status ready, okay, if I have all the deployments as ready, now I can set that our application is ready. Okay, so we have the wrapper, the, our application, this is the CR, and then we have the different elements. The most important part of these elements are the deployments. So our application will be ready whenever all our deployments are ready. That's why we have also a listener on the deployments. And finally, whenever we have everything, well, we need to build push and deploy our operator. So we want, we need to have a command to build from the Java perspective. This is the Maven wrapper clean package. But then we need to deploy this application into Kubernetes. So we can, there are other ways to deploy, but this is also a very convenient. So we produce the image and then we have a deployment YAML pointing to that image and we will deploy the operator. If you have questions as I'm uh, running and covering the different aspects, please just uh, say it loud. Um, so um, I, I, I'm aware that I'm trying to cover a lot of things in a few slides. Uh, but I, I thought it was important to give you the full perspective. So sorry for those that you, you already know very well the, the basics of, of Kubernetes. So now let's move to the, the basic two 
file types that we are going to find in our operator, Java, and also a lot of YAML. For the Java part, well, this is the skeleton of our application. So we have controllers, in this case, two controllers. Controllers are basically what it is being executed from the watcher. So we have the CR watcher and the deployment watcher. And then we have this, our CR is called WindUp. So we have the WindUp watcher and the WindUp controller. And the WindUp deployment controller, okay? After that, we have the model. So, well, we need to define this CRD that I was showing before that contains a definition with all the, the fields that are contained in the general definition of our application. Uh, I need to create a class for it because what I will receive from the client is a class. It's not a JSON directly. Okay, so I have the definition of my CR, my model. And then what I have is the WindUp operator. And in our case, we create the beans uh, using methods directly. And those beans are, so that producer will create, uh, well, the client bean, the namespace bin and the different bins used in the rest of the code. But as you can see, it's not a complex code. There are not thousands of classes involved. It's very easy. So the concept of an operator is very easy. Simply a watcher on a CR that does something. And that something can be deployed uh, an application, a very easy application, and that's it. That would be an, an operator. Obviously, you are not getting a lot of benefit from it, but you can start publishing, for instance, your application in Operator Hub. Also, what we have are the YAMLs for the deployment. So in this case, well, we have the namespace, YAML to create the namespace, for the role, for the role binding, the service account, and the CRD. Those are, those are the definitions. Then we have the deployment one. And the deployment is going to deploy the operator. Then I also created a few files that can create everything and delete everything for testing purposes. It's, it's faster doing this. And finally, a bunch of files that will uh, will help on publishing your operator in Operator Hub. In fact, these, these files are here, but only for convenience. Because when you want to publish your operator in Operator Hub, you need to go to the community operators repository in GitHub and create a pull request and add these files. So internally, in order to allow all the team to do reviews on the changes, I included these files in the same project. And whenever it is uh, approved, it's a matter only of copying this into the, the branch on the community operators project, and then submit the pull request. So let's take a look to the definite to the files. Only focus on the um, highlighted text. So it's only for you to see that, for instance, the CRD has this API version. That means okay, this object from Kubernetes in which version I'm using it. And then it is specified that the objects that you are going to create from this CRD are going to be name spaced. They mean you 
will create one object per namespace, so not one object that interacts with the whole cluster. And also, in your CRD, you can define an open API schema. So saying, okay, my application contains, as you can see here, host name and volume capacity. These two fields are, in this case, you can, um, further in the, in the file, you can specify which fields are required and which not. But then you can here, you can put default values. So if you create uh, a, a, a CR without specifying these files, these fields, sorry, they will take the, the default value. So you can define which is the structure of your application. Then the role, again, this role is going to, to define that this operator can has uh, access to deployments and can create, delete, get, list, and watch. So the cluster admin can say, okay, I don't want this operator to be installed because those access uh, are not okay for me. Or yes, I agree, it can be installed. As they are namespaced uh, access, probably mm, there's nothing to say because it's not affecting other namespaces, so other applications. With the service account, as you can see, well, we are relating, uh, we are creating this user for our operator. Then the role binding, binding is going to connect uh, the role and the service account. And finally, the deployment for the operator. Well, we specify in which namespace we are going to, to install this operator, and then we also define, okay, uh, the image for the operator, which is the image pool policy. And if it's going to watch a namespace or uh, cluster wide. So here we have like those YAML objects defined. And now let's go for the Java part. So we are going to create a new Kubernetes client that will take the default Kubernetes client class provided by this Fabricate Kubernetes client. Now with that, we have a connection to the cluster where the operator has been deployed. Then we have, uh, as I said, a specific client for this CRD, as you can see here, we say, okay, I want a default client in that particular namespace and for this custom resource. And that will provide a client that it is only for those resources. Then we use the context for the CRD client. It's only for something convenient from the client perspective. And in the end, we are going also to create this uh, namespace object that we are going to inject everywhere. The operator is very easy. So we can see here, more or less, which is the code for the operator. Basically, almost nothing. So it simply creates two watchers. That's it. The watcher for the CRs, wind up controller, and the watcher for the deployment controller. So for the wind up deployments. That's it. Those watchers are going to call the controllers. As you can see in the wind up controller, well, when we detect the event add, so the user goes and says to the operator, I want a new video club application. Then the operator will receive this add event and we execute this method called deploy. This is a, 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 a this is our class. It's not something provided from the client or Kubernetes. So we have a, cl a class called wind up deployment that simply will do 
client create deployment, client create ingress, client create uh, uh, the PVC, the, the private volume, uh, persistent volume uh, claim or the service. So it will create all the elements that our application needs. But if the operator receives an update, says, okay, so the application was deployed. Now I have received that that element has changed. The CR element changes because those elements have a part called status. So everything will update this status. Every time something updates the status, you will receive an update event. So when we receive an update event, okay, we are going to say, how many deployments my application need to have? Three. Do I have three? You, you can see here the, this conditional. Do I have three? Yes. Okay, then my application is ready. And with the deployments watcher, what, what it does is every time a deployment is updated because Kubernetes updates the status of every deployment when the health check expression has said the deployment is ready, those health check expressions can be defined in the deployment. And usually it's a function inside your pod call to an API or a function or a bash script that will return a value. So when that value is one, my application is ready because it does, I don't know, a curl to an endpoint and it gets information. So it says, okay, the application is ready. Then Kubernetes uses that script that is defined. And whenever that script returns a value that it is expected, it will say, okay, this, this pod is uh, okay. And when all the pods execute the CR update event with saying, I'm ready, well, the update, the, the, as you can see here, the uh, on update will check how many pods I have saying I'm ready three. Do I need to have three? Yes, okay, then I'm ready to. Apart from the status, what it is usually used is the word reconciliation or the reconcile method. That means that every time the operator receives an event, it will check that all the elements are the expected ones. So not about only the status, but if I, if the CR says, I need to have 10 deployments, 10 pods, but someone from the outside or even Kubernetes killed four pods. The operator will have to scale up four pods. If someone from the outside scale up to 20 pods, but the CR says this application needs to have 10, the operator will kill 10 pods. This is what you should do in this reconcile process. Reconcile with what it is expected is what I have. Yes, okay. If not, I need to modify what I have in order to be as what I expected. And what about testing the operator when I have it? Well, about the unit test, I'm not going to tell anything. Unit tests are methods, classes. Okay, you tell them, you, you test them. You are not going to unit test the Kubernetes client. You are going to test your methods and you should do it isolated. So unit test, okay, you know how to do them. But what about doing the integration test? Okay, I know my methods are running okay, but what about doing everything 
and being sure that the operator is doing the whole flow. Well, for that, what we have is Kubernetes mock server. What it does is simply mocking the Kubernetes API. So I have my client that will send all the actions to a mocked API. This mocked API can mm, behave as a CRUD, I mean, CRUD. So you, it, it will behave as if it was in fact uh, running Kubernetes. So then what you will do is to check, okay, this mock server has received the post methods that I was expecting. For instance, you create a, a CR in your integration test, and then you check that the API received, I don't know, three puts because Every put is a modification on the status of the CR. So if you have three deployments, at least you should have three puts in the CR because everyone said, I'm ready. Okay, you are checking um, the communication that should happen, but this can give you, well, a bit of confidence that at least your operator is reacting the way you would expect. In our case also, well, Quarkus provides this feature that uh, we can say, okay, in test, use this producer for producing a, uh, a bean that only happens on test. Why? Because the client cannot be the one as in production because we don't have are running Kubernetes. So it, the client cannot connect to anything. So the Kubernetes mock server can create a client. So we are going to say, okay, the producer that produces the bean for the Kubernetes client in test is going to get the client from the mock server. In local testing, what we do is use kind or minikube. So with minikube, you do minikube start and it will start a Kubernetes cluster. With kind, you do more or less the same. You do kind create and everything, well, starts and it creates what it is needed. So in this case, what we do is to have like the whole flow. Okay, we produce an image for our code. Uh, we load this image inside the registry of this Kubernetes in order to not put the image in an external uh, registry. We execute all the YAMLs to create the, the namespace, service account, role, the CRD. We deploy the operator. Okay, everything is done here. And now we create the CR. We create our video club application. We sleep during 20 seconds to everything happen in Minikube. And after that, what we are going to check is, okay, if all has gone okay, I should have 19 elements in that namespace because the operator has created four deployments, two ingresses, three services, two uh, persistent volume claims, four pods, and four replica sets. So if everything has done, has gone fine, I should have 19 elements. So if we execute this local test .sh, it will do the whole process of building, deploying, and testing your application in order to see that at least the flow has, has gone fine. But we also want to have it on our continuous integration. So every time we do a pull request modifying the operator, 
we want to be sure that the whole flow is running okay. So what I have shown you with the local test, we are going to do the same on a GitHub action. This GitHub action is going to use a mini cube in memory in that uh, GitHub action. And it's going to do exactly the same as we have seen before. It's going to build the application. It's going to deploy the operator and create the CR. It will wait for some time and it will query the cluster to see if the number of elements are the expected ones. If that's not the case, the pull request will not be allowed to be merged. So it's, it's fine at least to see that everything is uh, going with the normal flow. And the last step is whenever you have everything tested and fine, now you need to publish the operator. You can, there are operators that have not been published because are internal. But if you want to publish your operator, you can see here on the left, the operator hub.io that you can, you can go there and search for different operators. Now, when the time that I created this slide, there were around 170 operators. This is go growing uh, fast. So you can publish here your operator or consume the operator from here. So you need to install a PostgreSQL database. Okay, go and use the PostgreSQL operator. Just simply go install and that's it. Also, OpenShift has an internal operator hub uh, that looks similar, but uh, it's only for OpenShift. And to publish the operator in the operator hub, well, you need to create a pull request to this community operators uh, repository. Uh, there are two different folders, community operator and upstream community operators. The first one is for operators that will appear on the internal OpenShift operator hub. And the other upstream is operators that need to be 100% compatible with vanilla, vanilla Kubernetes. So you can do your operator that only works on OpenShift, then you cannot put it here. And it's easy to publish an operator. You need to create a CSV, it's a cluster service version, that simply contains several of the previous YAML files inside, and also uh, some visual information. As you can see here, uh, these uh, cards for the operators, they have, okay, the title, they have a description, they have uh, provided by, um, so, and you will see more whenever you uh, move from the steps on the installation. So all this information will be also put in the CSV. Then the CRDs that the operator is going to handle. Then there is a file called annotations for your operator to be annotated when you, you install it and a Docker file that will create a bundle. So with all this information, uh, it will create a, an image, a bundle that will be then installed in a catalog, but that's transparent for you. Whenever you create these files and you are submitted your pull request and it's merged, everything will be done on, on your own, on its own. So this CSV, in order for you to have a look, contains, okay, which is the image for the operator, the definition of the CRDs, so all the uh, fields that we saw before, also the deployments, again, which is the image for the operator, the resources for the operator, as you can see here, and the, the installation modes. So the, the operator can be installed only on its own namespace or in a specific single namespace or multi namespace or all namespaces. You define it here too. 
and keywords in order for the operator to be searched and grouped. Well, in order to, to deploy in, in Operator Hub and install it before going to doing the pull request, okay, you can create your own OpenShift. You can download uh, code ready containers that it is a, an OpenShift that you can run in your machine or uh, using the OpenShift, uh, let's say on demand version that you can have uh, even for free on, on, on Red Hat. And then you, you need to deploy this uh, operator. Okay, the first step is to have all those files and then to create a bundle. So build the bundle image about those files that I uh, showed before. So with this CSV, these files that are here, when you have these files, then what you are going to do is build a bundle image. Then you are going to tag with your version and you are going to push this image to a registry of your own. You can simply create an account on Quay.io for free and you can store your uh, operator there. Once you have the bundle, you are going to create the catalog. The catalog is the, the one containing all the operators. When we start with uh, OpenShift, we will have several. We have the community one, the Red Hat one, the certified one, and also we need to have our test catalog. So we are going to put our bundle in that test catalog and we are going to deploy the catalog into the OpenShift. Once we have it, then you can see your application, your operator in the operator hub, as you can see here. All the details can be followed with the code. I don't want to, to also bother you with uh, taking a look at this in on the slides. And the execution flow that you can see, for instance, in OpenShift is, okay, you go to your, the operator hub, the user goes to the operator hub, searches for a specific operator. Then once it the, he, she finds it, installs the operator, it specifies in which namespace uh, he or she wants this operator. And then the operator will appear in installed operators for that namespace. That's, that's it. You have it, you have the operator installed, but nothing happened in the end. Now, when you go to the operator, you will see a tab in order to create those CRs, those instances. So here, when, where you see migration toolkit for applications, we could read it as video club. So we are going to create a video club. For that, we are going to create, create instance. So with this instance, you will put all the fields that you have defined in your CRD, as you can see here all the elements. And with that, you will have an application installed by the operator. As you can see here, we are having two different applications, each one with each own uh, elements. As you can see here, deployment, service, replica set, pod, service, deployment, well, you name it. And in the end, when everything is ready, well, you can access your application as you can see here, well, we access uh, our web application uh, with this with this screen. So, well, we've seen the whole process of an operator, and hopefully, you you are still engaged, and uh, and with uh, with motivation to to know more about operators. Well, if that's the case, here you have the links that can help you uh, in order to continue with your operators. With the, the first link is for the operator that I've been um, explaining all the process. So our uh, WinDAP operator. Then you have, well, the 
Kubernetes API reference that can be helpful. The Kubernetes client that we've been using and the mock server that we have uh, used in our test cases. Also, obviously the Quarkus and uh, go and check the Kubernetes guides because uh, yeah, it has some, some tips and tricks for, for the combination Quarkus and Kubernetes. Also the operator hub uh, projects and the different tools that I have used, JIP to create the containers, Dive to inspect the layers and the files in every container, Podman in order to, uh, to handle those containers instead of using Docker, Quay as a registry for images, and then Minikube and Kind in order for you to test with a local version of, uh, of the Kubernetes cluster. And that's, that has been everything that I, that I had to, to share. Uh, hope, hopefully it has been so boring. I, I know that there's a lot of uh, contents here uh, covered, but I think that from this presentation, if you want to continue with operators on, on, on Kubernetes, uh, probably you have a lot of information here that you can come back and check. And uh, I would I would love to have had something like this when I started creating the operator, because well I needed to check several places, several things in order to have all of this in mind. Uh, so I would love to have this this presentation when I started. As I said. If you have doubts or uh, if you need help, please don't be shy. Don't hesitate to contact me and I will try to help you uh, as much as I can. And if you want to, to have a look also to other articles as test containers, testing camel or migrating to Quarkus, uh, please uh, check my, my blog and also the code. Uh, you can find everything about code in my GitHub repository. And that that has been all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. There are a few questions now available. We had a little problem with the question tab, but uh, looks like it's working now. Okay, let me switch on my cam. You can try to switch on yours too. Hopefully it will work fine. So, Okay. okay, perfect. Uh, I switch the view, so we are much bigger now. <laughs> okay, the first question is from uh, Lucas. He is asking a question on usage. How does a sysadmin interact with the operator? For example, how does a sysadmin tell an operator to scale up an application? Okay, so in fact, Something that I, I haven't said, but this, this is a good question that connects me to that point. In all this process, there are two users involved. One is the cluster admin that installs or allows a, an operator to be installed. Then there's like a regular user that is the one that is in fact creating an instance or scaling up the number of deployments for an application. The way to do that, it's very easy. In the CRD, there's a field that you can create, let's call video club movies that says, by default one, but once this CR is installed in the cluster, the user, not the sysadmin, the user can go to that CR, go to the YAML and modify the value from one to 10. If this field video club movies, in fact, represents deployments, the operator will take this value 
will get the deployment, will modify the number of replicas, and will store or send this object. And the replica set associated to that deployment will scale up the deployments. So the sysadmin doesn't need to do anything to scale up. The user can decide any time that he, she wants to deploy. So to scale up the application, if uh, the CRD allows a number to be put in that. Hope I have answered the question. Thank you very much. And uh, oh. so next question is from uh, Thomas. What are the typical disadvantages of a Kubernetes operator in Java versus one in Go? What are the typical advantages? So disadvantages and advantages of operators in uh, Java versus Go. Okay. Well, it uh, everything depends. So if you are a Golang developer, go and use Golang SDK. If you are not a Golang developer, then you need to decide if you want to start learning Go or going to the Java way. For the Java way, in my case, it's everything done manually. So if you if you if you take a look at the code, you see, well, you don't feel like there's any Kubernetes notion anywhere. It's a watcher that reacts to the event and creates some things. That's it. In the Go uh, way, the Go SDK provides you a lot of things in order to save you time. So you create a class CRD and the SDK will create the watcher, will create the reconcile, uh, probably will create also the, the YAML for you and also will scaffold the, uh, the entire operator. In the way that I've done this, it's everything manual. But there's a Java SDK uh, project already going on on GitHub. Um, and this is also the, the option that the Quarkus team is going to follow. So for future Java operators, uh, it's better to also take a look to that uh, project that was not ready enough when I started my operator. But um, yeah, I, I, I can, so if you search for Java SDK operator in GitHub, you will find the project. Mm -hmm. That's that's the drawback of using this manual approach on Java. Thank you. And the next question again from Thomas, is there a file featured and documented operator template for Quarkus? or some example operators based on uh, Quarkus to start with? There are few, there are few, let's say, hello worlds operators that you can find over there, but there's no like an official guide or an official template. But, if you move to use this Java SDK, Java operator SDK project, certainly is the way to go because it will provide, it will scaffold the skeleton for your operator and it will try to give you uh, like the best, best practices in order to do the operator. But said that, I would say, that in the end, the operator is very simple. It's, it doesn't do much. It's simply few watchers, few things, not super complex. So that's, this SDK can provide search and value, but unless you are planning to create 1000 operators well, 
you can start using the Java uh, operator SDK and you can save some time and do things in a more uh, official way, but it's not in the end something super complex to do it manually. Too. Mm -hmm. And there are several operators over there. StreamZ, for instance, is one that they have used uh, the Fabricate Kubernetes client manually as I have done uh, without any issue. Thank you very much. Uh, and one more question. Regarding the wind up operator, where in those 10 files is the actual log logic to decide what to do? And what does it? In fact, in wind up operator, the logic is in the controllers. So the the wind up controller that it is the one that reacts to the events on the CR is the one that when it detects a, a creation event, it executes the deployment. The deployment is a code that simply uses the client says client create deployment with these params and that's it with all the objects. And in the same uh, controller, when it detects that the CR, every time that uh, it receives an event, it says, okay, our CRD has a field to say number of replicas desired for one of the pods because our application consists on one web pod and then one executor that it is a client of a JMS queue that does some things. And for this client, we can have one to multiple pods, not for the web one, because it doesn't have any sense to have two webs. But for the executor, we can have several. So that is a field in the CRD that the user can modify and say, okay, I now, instead of one, I want five. The operator detects this change, gets the deployment, changes the number of replicas and sends the request to Kubernetes. After that, what happens is the deployment gets updated. This implies to modify a replica set, but this is done on the Kubernetes side. The replica set will modify the number of replicas and will start the pods needed or it will kill the pods that are uh, not needed. So everything is done in the controller. Thank you very much. And these are all questions for now. I check the chat. Yeah, so all questions answered. Very good. So I continue with the slides. Okay, um, we have some more events coming soon, like a JQA assistant. Oh, the double future is twice here. <laughs> That's a bug. Uh, we have something about remote mob programming and patterns for scalable microservices. Oh, that's very important. We want you. We want you and your knowledge. So if you have a suggestion for a topic or for a speaker, or maybe you are a speaker yourself, please uh, get in touch with us. And uh, if you are speaking for the Java user group, you will get a really nice present like Jonathan here such a really cool and unique Java user group, Swiss knife. Yes. <laughs> of course, a new one. This is mine. <laughs> and mm. uh, if you want to get in touch with us, uh, you can, of course, send us an email via our website, or you can join our Slack community. And if you want to have an invitation for our Slack community, you can get this from our website as well. So that's it. Let me thank you again, Jonathan, for your very interesting talk. I will definitely try this out. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you somewhere soon in person, maybe at a conference, hopefully. And uh, that's it so far. Thank you very much. And uh, everyone gets forwarded automatically to the Java user group website 
to leave feedback on the feedback form. And again, please do this. And if you leave your email address afterwards, you can win an IntelliJ license. So thank you very much. Oh, I see there are some more questions coming in, or maybe um, P.T. Koch writes, oh, what is, what about the alpha operators? Oh, you have answered uh, already. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Have a nice pleasure. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you. And see you. Bye-bye. Bye. See you.